Thank you so much for that super kind introduction. I'm always sort of hiding in the back when folks, folks read my, uh, my bio. It's very sweet. Um, good afternoon. Hopefully everybody had a wonderful lunch. And today I'm going to be talking about how cool things happen at the edges. They definitely did for me. And as, as I go through this presentation, hopefully it will give you a chance to reflect about how this may be important to your life. So what are edges? Well, I think that depends on each individual. So you're going to hear my story, but hopefully can apply this to your life. But I define edges as uncomfortable places, places that we don't really want to be, places we don't want to spend time. They're less explored, but as a result, discoveries often happen here. Innovation often happens here. <coughs> Those who live on the edge, well, I love that picture at the end. To the rest of us, they often appear crazy. We tell them their ideas are insane, that they'll never work. And one of the things that I have found throughout my experiences is that these are people who started pushing their edges at a very, very young age. And thus, by the time they've, been, they've gotten older, it's less uh, scary for them to do so. But at the same time, they're inspirational, they're envied, successful, well-regarded, impactful, insightful. So how many people in this room would like for their legacy to the world to be, you know, I was called a visionary for my work in, or you know, my research contributed to some sort of awesome scientific discovery, or I changed the world, or I helped to change someone's life? How many people in this room would like for their legacy to be something of that nature, right? Of course, we all would. But of course, the problem then is, how exactly do you do it? A little bit more complicated. So the general problem is this, that everybody wants to be unique, everybody wants to be special, and yet throughout our lives we are encouraged to pick safe paths. Um, all throughout my childhood my parents really wanted me to go to medical school. Uh, they've been asking me that question for the last you know, 30 some years. So are you going to go to medical school? You know, I went to college, like, are you going to go to medical school? I went and got my PhD. So are you going to go to medical school? And um, there's a reason, right? Because the safe path is actually effective. You can be very happy, content, you can feel secure, you can have a very comfortable lifestyle. So I'm not here to suggest that this is uh, the wrong way of doing things, but to propose a different way of viewing the world. So one of the things I have seen in, in a lot of my work is that I think we're taking it too far. You know, we, we don't keep score anymore. There are no winners, right? wrong. Companies are adapting, adopting this merit badge promotion tactic so that every three to six months, you know, they're promoting their staff just so that everyone can feel good. Parents are calling, acting as agents for their kids. So parents are calling, you know, if you're trying to go and get a job, your parents will call in and say, you know, you should hire my son or daughter for this. And if you don't get the job, parents will call and say, well, why didn't, why didn't you hire this person? And there's a term that's been coined called the trophy generation that describes this current era. Focused on comfort, less likely to spend time pushing the edges. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story. But about 10 years ago, a very good friend of mine gave me this analogy. He said, you know, you're born with a, a hand, a hand that you play. And the whole goal throughout your life is to update this hand so that you have as many aces as possible that you hold. And you have to play the game, play the game of life, but you want to play with aces. You don't want to play with, you know, twos or threes. So that's me. Um, all throughout my life, my natural talent was in music. Uh, I learned how to play the piano at a very young age, went to the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. This came easily. But interestingly enough, I really liked science. And this did not come as easily. I had to study really hard. It took a lot of time. Uh, when I was 11, I started working on an independent science fair project. And I was, was really excited. I wanted to study viruses. I made a bunch of phone calls. Nobody called me back. One of the companies that I had reached out to actually called my parents because they were concerned. They said, you know, your daughter, there might be something wrong with her. Uh, you better keep an eye on her because she wants to study viruses. You better see what she's doing in your basement. So nobody wanted to help me except that gentleman on the bottom left hand corner, Michael, who was the director of a local public health lab. And he came and he, you know, he assisted me. He was my mentor. 
He was the only one who responded. And as a result, I was able to look at a plant which had anti-herpes simplex virus properties. It's the virus that causes cold sores. So you can imagine how popular I was in middle school being the herpes virus girl. But we won't go into that. Went to MIT for undergrad. And while at MIT, uh, you know, one of the things that I had been taught from a young age was the importance of giving back to the community, the importance of community service. And I couldn't find anything that I was really passionate about, so I started Science from Scientists to get kids excited about science. And right now, you know, we've, we've really increased our, our, our size. So back in the day, I, I piloted the program with a $119 budget, and we've now reached a uh, three-quarter of a million dollar budget, which is very exciting. We're state endorsed. We have about 40 employees working for the company and nearly 20,000 students served. We send real scientists into classrooms every other week for the entire year to learn you know, hands-on, exciting uh, STEM material. The challenges of running a nonprofit. Well, these are the three. Now, nobody had ever taught me how to raise money. I had to go and fail and learn and eventually adapt. Presentation skills. I am an enormous introvert, so every time I have to get up on the stage, every time I need to give a presentation, it takes a tremendous amount of energy and something I had to learn and practice. And then the people. You know, nobody ever really teaches you how to manage people. Um, you know, you, you, you grow up very used to being with yourself and maybe some siblings. Expanding your edges of tolerance, being able to know that everyone is different from you, people have different hopes, dreams, fears, being able to read those and understand them is a critical part of running any sort of business and learning how to listen, of course. So the second side of my story is interesting. Back when 9-11 happened, I was an undergrad at MIT and you know, basically sort of a how to best explain, but I was um, not really into television. I didn't watch TV. I was kind of an antisocial, uh, interesting human being. And when this happened, my parents said, really, you know, you should, you should start paying attention to, cur to these current events. You should be watching the news. So I said, all right, fine. I went and I bought a, a TV tuner for my computer. And one night, a group of us were watching TV, and the Miss America pageant was on. And all my friends turned to me, and I think as a sort of joke, said, you should do this. And I said, not in a million years. I would never do this. And so they signed me up. <laughs> so I received an email saying, you know, congratulations, you've been signed up to participate in this local pageant. And I was horrified, mortified, having never done anything like this. I think I owned one black suit, one black dress, and one one-piece Speedo swimsuit. That was my entire repertoire of, of clothes. So they kept bugging me. They kept bugging me. Finally, I said, all right, I'm going to go and I'm going to try. So I show up, and that was me, literally uh, completely out of water, never having any experience doing this. It was very, very bad. And I didn't win, of course. And my father actually called me that evening and said, well, how did it go? And I said, it was terrible. It's horrible. It was a disaster. I, I didn't know how to walk or talk. I mean, I looked, it was just so, you know, embarrassingly bad. And he said, well, is there something that you can learn from this whole experience? Is there something you can do to better yourself? And so, though I wanted to run and hide, he was right. The answer was yes. So I signed up for Toastmasters. I hired a personal trainer. I learned how to do my hair. I learned how to walk. So just to give you an example of how bad this was and how it is possible to change, um, year one, a little squidgy around the edges. Year two got a little better. And by the time we got to year three, when I finally won, I had learned the system a little bit better than I had before and became Miss Massachusetts, uh, went to Miss America, and had a very, very you know, interesting time. So we come back to this whole idea of medical school, right? Because my parents still wanted me to go to medical school. And one of the appearances that I had done at the VA hospital in Bedford, they, someone had approached me and said, well, what are you gonna do with your life? And I said, I don't know. I might go to graduate school, medical school, maybe both, I'm not sure. And they said, there's somebody you have to meet. He's a gentleman who recently sold his company. He's a famous scientist. You need to meet him. He has amazing ideas about how the world should work. So I talked to him, Wayne Matson, and 
you know, I was inspired by the research that he was doing. And at the time, he was getting an appointment at BU Medical School as a professor. So I applied to BU Medical School and decided that I would do my PhD with him. Now, I never would have met him had it not been for the whole pageant system, right? So I, I went and did my PhD with Wayne. And then, amazingly enough, as a result of this, we've now started a biotech company together. So does, do these things matter? Yes, very, very, very acutely. Um, I also met my husband, who is the CEO of a company called iRobot, Colin Engel, at a robot contest because of science from scientists. I was invited to judge, and so was he. So you just never know. Life is so strange. It's so funny. So just very briefly about CounterPoint. You know, our goal is to help you to minimize getting a horrid disease, horrid chronic disease, by modifying your gut microbiome. So we're gut microbiomicists, I guess you could say. We're into preventive medicine. We have developed a diagnostic test and a not natural product-based intervention, a therapy that you can take to heal your gut microbiome so that you prevent disease in the long term. The challenges of running a for-profit. Well, guess what? They're very, very similar. Luckily, some of the experiences that I had in starting science from scientists really helped as now I've gone through you know, an A round raising money for the biotech. It definitely made a very, very big difference in my life. So how do you actually find these edges? Well, I'd say start small. It's really difficult to make change in your life, but you know, those of us who say we want to get in shape, don't go run a marathon. Take a walk. If you're uh, afraid of public speaking, try telling jokes to your friends. Do things that are small, but that push you beyond your levels of comfort. You know, I, this assembling a chair, if you ever really want a challenge, go to Ikea and buy some of their furniture and see if you can put it together. Or you know, programming your thermostat, just examples. And over time, what will happen is the combined energies that you spend in pushing these edges will help you to gain the confidence that it takes to do other things. How will you know it's working? Well, you stop being able to look at everyone else around you and judge yourself based on them. Because no one else is going to be doing what you're doing. And that's both really wonderful, but also very, very scary. You learn to set your own standards and push your own limits. And those will end up defining your edges. So this is a really great poem, which I don't have the full context of here, but I think if you're interested, go home and Google it. But these are some of my favorite lines from the end. It's from The Road Not Taken. I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. So thank you.